I'm going to argue, it's not the case, that people invent the idea of divinity. They invent specific gods, whether that's Jupiter or Zeus or Neptune or who it is. But they don't invent the idea of, of divinity. Something has to be divine. Let me tell you why. It's not because of great long abstruse logical proof, complete with modal operators. It's not that. It's something much more obvious. The sum total of reality has to be self-existent because there's nothing else for it to depend on. I'll give you a chance with that. I'm going to say it again. The sum total of all reality has to be self-existent either in whole or in part just because there's nothing else. If there's nothing for it to depend on, it doesn't depend. And one of the great differences among the world religions is that difference between in whole or in part. In Hinduism and Buddhism, it's the whole that's, rea that's divine. And everything that occurs within that whole, in the created world in which we live, that appears not to be divine because it comes into, be into being and passes away, is merely illusion. The other view that reality is in part divine, the part of the reality that's divine is God, and God calls into existence all the rest of it, which always depends on him. That's the view held by Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So you, you immediately get from this the two possible ways that the religion could be different. Two possible ways, in, in the way the non-divine depends on the divine, but the divine itself is not a hypothesis. Now, if this is the right definition of divinity, and it can impact theories, then I owe you an explanation as to why nobody ever tried to construct a Christian philosophy until the previous century, until the last century. Why do Christians think that wasn't a possible chore, it wasn't a task they could undertake? We, I read to you Father Copleston's statement, so you know he's just saying, no, that doesn't make any sense. There's not a Christian biology or a Christian math, so how could there be a Christian theory of reality or theory of knowledge? <clears throat> and here's the reason that's got missed. Philosophy begins among the ancient pagan Greeks. And they assume that it's the universe that's self-existent in part. So if this is the complete universe, they start philosophy by trying to locate what it is in that universe that is self-existent and all the rest depends on it. And this is the way they see philosophy and science proceeding. You identify what's divine, and then you trace the causal pathways to everything else, and this shows the, gives you the right explanation of reality. When Christianity comes on the scene, philosophy is already five to 600 years old. <clears throat> They've been at this for centuries. The early Christians look at this and they say, well, it can't be right that the divine is in the world. It's not, it's God. It's no, I mean, not mm -hmm. in the world, God can be present. It's no part of the universe that's divine instead of God. So they deny that, but they ask the question, why couldn't it be that something in the universe is what everything else depends on so long as you add, and that depends on God? So you can't regard that as divine, but you could continue to regard it as what everything else in the universe depends on and deny its divinity and claim God creates this and this creates everything else. And so that's just what they did. Now, my objection to that is that it violates Colossians chapter 1, which says that God has created all things visible or invisible, and the only one on, th on whom all things depend is Christ. In other words, only Jesus Christ m mediates the power of God to creation. So saying that, no, it's the realm of perfections, or it's matter, or it's matter plus the perfections, or it's matter plus logical, uh, mathematical laws, or logical, we combine materialists with Pythagoras, or whatever it is, that's all, that's all wrong. There isn't anything 
not only are we denying that any part of the cosmos is divine, is self-existent, we're, divi we're denying that any part is what creates all the rest of it. There is nothing there. It all directly depends on God. And why? Because Colossians says that it's only Christ who mediates the power of God. Through him all things are made, visible or invisible. And he is the one that hangs all things together. That's what the Greek says. So that in-between position is what has prevented most Christians from thinking that there needs to be a distinctively Christian approach. The Eastern Orthodoxy was not fooled on this point, and St. Gregory Palamas, a theologian of the 14th century, says this, the Christian can tolerate no mediating substance between God and creatures. Hmm. The absolute rejection of that, of that ploy, that move, and yet that's the one that holds the field today among most Christians and most, among most Jews in philosophy. This is an attempt to explain why the Incarnation helps to break through philosophical problems in other systems of philosophy, and specifically what I call the simulation theory problem that I perceive to be present in Judaism as it's been communicated to me. And it's also more clearly visible in Islam. And so we can critique Islam as maybe the more clear example of what the problem is. Um, and if my understanding is of Judaism is not if I'm not representing well what is actually believed, then um, I would say that's Jacob's fault. So you should criticize him because he's not explaining Judaism clearly. This is work based on the video series by Dr. Roy Clauser in his book and Herman Doiwer's philosophy. And it's a Christian philosophy that is based on the Incarnation as sort of the core element that makes it work. And the problem that he's criticizing is that most other philosophies such as Platonism or Aristotle, what Christians have done and others have done as well is to simply take what they say and their, their um, understanding of how the universe and reality works and simply say that the uncreated, self-existent, necessary component of making that system work, which he defines as the divine, the divine is the God revealed in the Hebrew scriptures. So you could take Platonism and then say, and the supreme thing behind that system and the world of perfections is God. Or you take Aristotle and you say the supreme thing behind the uh, you know all this material reality is God. Uh, the unmoved mover and all these things. Now the problem is, is that they have descriptions of these of their divines that really don't fit with the description of God as he is described in scripture. And the reason why is that the attributes that God has revealed about his character are created aspects of himself in his desire to communicate about himself to us and to be known by us. So we have no problem considering the fact that God created the world, but the world, the universe, and everything that we live in also has these laws that govern it, such as the rules of mathematics, physics, and um, logic, and things like that. Now, if you believe that material is the ultimate source behind all uh, creation, those things 
sort of become imaginary. Uh, and he gives some good example of this in his lecture series of how, uh, like, one guy describes Adams as a, as a useful fiction because he believes that the only thing we can know is sense perception. And since we can't perceive Adams, it's just sort of a useful thing to believe in to help make sense of this world. Um, and for the materialist, when they get down to it, the laws that they, the laws by which they do their scientific research and all these things are either part of the creation or they, or that is what they think is the divine. And that's what caused the universe to come about. And the problem is that many philosophers, such as Plato and Aristotle, will take some of these things like the laws of logic and say these laws of logic are eternal and immutable. Nothing can change them. They are invisible. They exist outside of what we can observe, but they are clearly true because when we use mathematics or logic or any of these things, it, it works. And therefore what they say is that that is a part of the divine. That's one of the characteristics of what it means to be divine. God, God was this being who's always had these characteristics. But what um, Dr. Clauser brings up is that in Colossians where it says that God creates all things visible and invisible, that means that not only has he created the material reality that we live in, but also created these laws and things that we govern um, and understand and, and are able to study the universe that he's created. And the problem is, is that when you conflate something that is created uh, and say that that created thing is in fact a part of who God is, then you limit God to the confines of that thing. God can't do anything that transcends the laws of logic. God can't do anything that transcends the boundaries of mathematical laws or, or something like that. Because you make these laws part of his, his nature, they he's then limited by them in a sense. And re really, nothing that we can ever observe is God himself. But he has created things, including visible and invisible things, so that we can know him and understand him and perceive what he is like. So in a sense, they are not the real things, but they are, in some way, the best analogies that we can work with in order to understand. Now, the problem that I see, and I'll say with Islam specifically, is that Islam has then put a limitation on God in saying that he is ineffable and innoble, and does not have a corporeal body, does not exist materially the way that this creation does, and saying that he never would, and ultimately it seems never can. So God cannot have a son. God cannot become a human being. And when I read of what I hear about um, Islam, it, it seems to me that basically they took what they saw as limitations of the God of uh, the Hebrew scriptures or the God of Christianity, of Sans Christ, and then what they perceived as weaknesses in the story or uh, didn't fit their their um, image of what an all-powerful, omniscient God would be, they sort of just made him bigger and better. And ultimately, that by conflating things that the Hebrew Bible would say is created, and some of this is based on Proverbs chapter 8, where it talks about how God created wisdom, um, that they are in fact limiting God. And in saying that God never can or never would become a man or have a son who is a human son in some sense, they create this 
unbridgeable gap between creation and creator. It makes it very difficult to accept the reality of God with and understand him in any meaningful way. Um, because ultimately everything comes through human um, human interactions. And now that we you know, say like Muhammad is the final prophet and there will be no others, well, Muhammad was the last person that had some ability to communicate with God in a way where God can speak to him directly and then he can share that with other people. So now we have no... Uh, no knowledge of what we should be doing except for what has been revealed in the past. I see a similar problem in, in Judaism in, the, in that it seems that they have, in reaction to Christianity, decided that the interpretation of Scripture that refutes the idea of the Incarnation is the correct one, and that God is, and, and what it does is the same thing. It ultimately, ultimately makes God unknowable. It creates a, an unbridgeable chasm between creation and the creator. Now, in, in this video series, Dr. Clauser says that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all hold that God is not necessarily the totality of creation, but that he stands outside of creation. But this is a difficult thing to conceive of in, in this uh, standing outside, or um, can you stand outside something without standing within another context? And so this is where the kind of agent arena distinction gets a little murky, because we would say God creates the universe, and that is an arena. But he creates that universe. Is it external to himself, or is it within himself? And this is why I say it starts to bump into the simulation kind of theory, because the whatever if something is created, but it's totally internal to me. It's essentially imaginary. We don't really have any way of conceiving of something existing that is not existing outside of ourselves. And so what we create, if we cannot create we as humans with the ability that we do have to make things, um, and we can make invisible things, for instance, if I write a story. Now, I, the story starts in my imagination, and I write it on paper. But the paper is not the thing that I've created. That's just a vehicle to express the creation. What is created is the words themselves. And if those words are only created in my imagination, and I never speak them or write them out loud, to what extent do they actually exist? And if that is the nature in which we exist in relation to God, then it is essentially a simulation. Now, it's not, if that is how it is, that, that, then that's how it is. But then we are, in a sense, stuck in this position of God is here, we are within God, and then the, we, can't, we can't relate to him on any, on any level, except for as the creator to the created but in an imaginary sense. Uh, and I even thought about this in a sense, you know, when a woman becomes pregnant, she has a child living within her. And to the child and the mother, the other exists in a very real way. Now, the awareness of that existence is not immediate. Uh, we don't know exactly when the child becomes self-aware to the extent that a fetus is. They are. Babies certainly are learning and experiencing things while they're in the womb. We don't know at what point that happens. And the mother may not know that she is pregnant until several weeks after she become pregnant. And there is a sort of relationship between the mother and the baby while the baby is in her womb. But 
it's 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 equally difficult for the other to have a proper conception of what that person is and it's only when the child is born and then the child becomes its own separate person that it can know the mother and the mother can know the child and you know you can add to this the whole idea of uh, growing up and the child you know once the child becomes an adult then the mother and the child can relate as two adults now of course the relationships between parents and children are always changing there's never going to be a way where um, it's an equal relationship but um, essentially the the more the more they are separated in a sense the more they can learn to understand and know each other and eventually, you know, as this is often the case, when a child grows up and the parent becomes elderly, the child then, the roles are reversed, where the parent is being taken care of by the child in a similar way to how the child, uh, the parent took care of the child. And you know, then that even, you know, happens in a sort of similarly, similarly reversible progression as childhood development. Um, and so in the afterlife, I guess you could say, then the, they have a very uh, consistent understanding of one another. Their, their experience is so similar and there's so many points of connection that they can understand each other very clearly and they can communicate what is different about their experiences because there's so much commonality between them. And this is um, this is the, the 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 reason why. In many ways, I, I admire the faith of the Orthodox Jews so much because they don't have the example of God being human um, in not accepting this, the Gospels. Whereas for the Christian, I can understand that God fully understands everything about my experience. Not simply because he is omniscient and he can read my mind and he can see everything that's happening, but that he embodied those experiences. And in this way, I would say even the Christians can go astray when they make too much of the divine nature of Christ to the detriment of his hum humanity. They are, the divinity of Christ is most necessary for, for it to have happened and for God to understand us. But the humanity of, of Christ is what's the most necessary for us to understand God. And in that way, I can understand that God knows exactly what it's like to be a human, to walk around, to have a body with these feelings that it has, the emotions, the physical pain, the, the joys, of, you know, all these things. And in believing that he has embodied that experience fully, I can relate to him in a way that I could not if if he was what seems to me this unknowable, unapproachable God. And I would say that this is more present in the actual writings of Islam. I think that in Judaism I, I don't I don't think that people discount the idea that you can pray to God and have a personal relationship with him and you can hear his voice. And as Do uh, Dr. Clauser speaks about in one of his other um, lectures, one of the, the most uh, common experiences that people have in encountering God, which creates a belief in God, is simply by reading the scriptures and having a 
self-evident realization that it is true and that God and they encounter God in that way and certainly I would say in my own experience while I've had some maybe experiences that would be more mystical the most common experience I have of knowing God is there and feeling his presence is simply that his scripture the scripture comes to mind you know all the circumstances when I'm going through it, you know, however memory works, we're not really in control of what comes to the fore of our memory, but God brings particular scriptures to mind, and, it, and, and in that way, I believe that I'm hearing his voice. That's why the scriptures still speak to us. And so I would say that's, that in, in practicality, that's probably the experience that many Jewish believers have. But the problem is, is that because they have decided to emphasize the ineffable and uh, unhuman aspects of God's nature to such a high degree, on a philosophical level, it, it just it just makes it seem like, well, there's no way to know anything about God until we are no longer in this simulation, you know, which they would say is what life right now is and that, and that it's a, a hope that in an afterlife the truth will be revealed in some way that our minds will be expanded to some degree that we can understand who God is but I think that if we understand that God did create not only the physical reality including us for the sake of us knowing him, that there should not be any limit on what he would do to uh, to complete that. And so to categorically remove the notion that God could become a, a man for, in a real sense, I think that's the thing that creates a, the, the distance that makes uh, the gap between God and humans really a, a sort of a, almost a blind leap of faith, which I don't believe is the way that God intends us to have faith. I think our faith is to be a trust in what is evident. And it's evident that everything has a creator. Everything has, this is all dependent on something else. And the thing that it's all dependent on is God. Of course, it's not only the relational aspect of Jesus that makes the Incarnation important. I think that that's a starting point for most people in that to conceive, and, and this is sort of the problem, is that it's hard to distinguish between a God that is ineffable and uncomprehendable and the atheist's notion of what Christians and Jews and Muslims believe about God. By making God this thing so outside of the creation that he's just completely other, it's understandable why so many people therefore think he's imaginary. Because we have this world, and this is the world, and we have it, and it's here, and all the stuff is here. So why do we care if there's this unknowable thing outside of it? Except that apparently he he um, sometimes like strikes people with lightning bolts, or he sends plagues and disasters and things like that. In the mythologies of the pagans, it's for the reason of, ah, the humans make too much noise, so we send a good plague to thin them out, and now the gods can get some sleep. And that's obviously not a, a god that's capable of creating all of reality. I think that the personal aspect of, and this is what Francis Schaeffer says, is that God is infinite and personal. And he differentiates between, there's only really three basic sort of cosmologies from which everything came. Either everything came from an impersonal and infinite beginning 
which would be something like the Buddhist conception, or to say that the universe itself is God, or material is divine. In, not that you're uh, ascribing God-like qualities to it, but believing that matter alone, or matter and gravity, or something like that, is enough in and of itself to create the universe. Or, it's um, nothing, everything came from nothing, which he says is virtually impossible to contemplate because it's not even space um, or emptiness. Like, there's always, like, we can't conceive of what nothing means. How could nothing, how could everything come from nothing? Then, and, and if that's the case, then why isn't it? everything just always coming into existence all the time everywhere like from nothing or what why is there something rather than nothing why do we you know it's a it's a really difficult thing to actually believe and conceive of you know like even when the materialists say it they're saying like oh there was some law about gravity or about quantum physics and then because there was that law everything came into being well you just made that law which is not visible, but it is something, that's your source of everything. And in the Christian viewpoint, it, according to the Bible, we would say that that law itself was created. Now, if you're doing Christian Platonism or something like that, you might say that that law is part of God's nature, but it's only only part of his nature in that he created it to be that way so that we could understand it. Um, so, and then of course the third possibility is that the creator of the universe is infinite and personal. And so while we cannot conceive of God on the level of his infiniteness, because we are finite, he is infinite, we can relate to him on the level of the personal. And the, the that, and not, and not saying only in that he is a human, but that he has he does have attributes that we consider to be per personality and we we are of course created and in a sense he is to whatever extent we can fathom this he's created those same sort of attributes for himself so that we can be in a relationship with him now to put a limit on how far into this creation God's willing to go seems arbitrary um, because is language part of God's essence or is that a, cre a, a created thing I would say God created language as a means so that he could communicate with us he created math so that he could communicate with us he created um, logic so that he could communicate with us he created matter so that we could so that he could uh, relate to us and to, to stop it at the point of well human human body real humanity that's one thing God can't do is to put a severe limitation on it and I would say that while Islam has made that like official within their scriptures in the Hebrew Bible that's only through interpreting passages that you would say unequivocally that's something God cannot or would not do is become a human being. And I think you know when, when we're going to put limitations on what God can cannot do we have to be very careful about that. But the questions I would more or less want to have, have answered are number one, can God create anything outside of himself including an environment in which he can live. Um, number two, can he create anything that is of, of the same nature of himself so that he can interact with himself in a way that two separate people would interact with each other. And number three, can God 
fully come into this creation in a way that he can actually experience it the same way that the created beings do and not from a distant standpoint. And I think that those answers are in a sense really perhaps answerable in the uh, incarnation. And I think what the resurrection does and the creation of a new heaven and a new earth which are firmly established in Jewish beliefs. That gives a vehicle for something to be created externally from God, yet not imaginary. Now, this is my conception of it, kind of just, obviously no, no description will be perfect, but from a metaphorical standpoint, this was the thing I wrote a long essay about, shared it with Cal, and we had a conversation about it a little bit. But, but, you know, I think that what God truly desired was whatever is the new heavens and the new earth. And that is not, I think, let me say, that is not a simulation per se. That's not a thing that he's simply running. But in order to create anything, you have to imagine it first. You have to conceive of it first. And so what we are living now is in the, in the conception of how we get to that reality. So this this simulation kind of um, thing, it, it works in a sense, but um, if you know that you are present within it and that you are having, I guess you could say, an active role in shaping what your part of that reality will be, it that makes it very different from the viewpoint of well, this is a simulation so nothing matters or we can't know if anything's real therefore it may be a simulation and so the, what I think you know, we have not only the incarnation but through the resurrection Christ showing that, that is the way in which somehow he can relate to God separate from himself, in, in a sense, portion of God exiting the imaginary, exiting the arena, the arena that encapsulates our arena of the universe, so that he can interact with God, but yet being able to come within and interact with us. And I don't know if these are these are totally coherent ideas, and I don't know if God can necessarily create something that is equal to himself and external to himself. But I think he certainly could create something that is almost like himself and then live within that world. So in, in a sense, if, if this is a simulation, then I think that God would create the simulation not to observe it from an, from afar, but so that it could be something that he could live within. Um, and I think the problem with like the Islamic view, this man, that that, and that's one of the problems that's solved by the concept of the egalitarian Trinity is that is that there is a relational aspect within God prior to him deciding to create humans or angels or anything else. Um, but putting that aside, the problem with Islam is without creating the world and the universe and people, the God of Islam has nothing to do. And therefore, while he, while he is necessary and we're dependent on God in that viewpoint, he's also dependent on us to have meaning. And this was something that, that uh, Dr. Clauser does mention in, this, in a sense that God has eternal, uh, God is eternal and, and infinite and exists in all manner prior to creation. But he um, is not but creator is not one of his attributes 
until he creates everything that he creates. Rather than say until, just to say what is before. And one of the things that he creates is time. So is there a time, you know, it's hard to conceive of something being before when time is not a concept that exists. And, you know, this is where it all gets into sort of, sort of crazy stuff. But, but, um, but that is, that's part of what I was talking about. And, and what I see uh, the problem with where it, as it relates to Judaism specifically is that if you decide that an interpretation of the scripture which says m makes it impossible for God to become a human being or for that to mean anything and it's okay you know it's okay that it's paradoxical to say Jesus is fully God and fully human because if God is not in some manner the resolution of paradoxes then he is, in a, in a sense, therefore, subject to the laws of logic. Um, whereas, if he's the creator of the laws of logic, he can also do things that exceed the laws of logic. The laws of, so, of logic are something that he creates for us to understand things about him, but he is not bound by them. Uh, and what, when we decide that our conception of God will contain one of these created elements that he is not necessarily volunteered to take on um, as part of his, his identity to relate towards us, then we have a, mis, a, mis, a, a miscalculated conception of who God is. And if we are worshiping a created aspect of God, that's similar in a sense to worshiping creation, and that could, in its, in and of itself, lead to a form of idolatry. And I think that this is the problem with Islam and Judaism that is fervently opposed to Christianity, or that con considers the Christian belief to be a form of idolatry because it's not idolatry if it is true about who God is if if God is the if God has chosen to become human and reveal himself in this way then to worship him is not idolatry and simply saying three equals one doesn't make any sense is to subject God to the laws of logic, um, which he created, and therefore you're diminishing him by reducing him to something less equal than or less to a created thing, the laws of logic, and then it's not, is it really him that you are worshiping? Or are you worshiping your conception of who God is? And I think a similar thing can be done in that Islam and, and certain um, concepts within Judaism raises the concept of monotheism to a point where that is idolatry. And that you can have an idolatrous affection towards a, image, a, a conception of monotheism that places God in a unapproachable position where no one can relate to him. And anytime any, anybody tries to make any sort of uh, claims about God and what he is or how he relates to us, it can be late, you know, that, that claim can be labeled as idolatry um, and incorrect because no one can descri describe how how God truly is. And so that that's that's the tension that I feel in this um, this issue and why I think that it's it's why I think that there is probably such a trend towards secularity within the Jewish community community. So many Jews have, have abandoned their faith because I think that it has 
become for most people an unapproachable thing. Um, and it just it seems that it, maybe it's just empty devotion to a God that is uh, unknowable. And and, it, and it, it, it makes him to be so hidden and so uh, inactive in what we see and in our everyday life that it, you know it takes an incredible amount of faith to hold on to that, which I admire. But at a certain point, faith in something that is um, trustworthy, you know, as a rule, trust, relying on it. Uh, Putting a hope in is is one thing, but uh, you know, a fully blind faith or whatever, with with uh, with all of the evidence opposing it, at a certain point, you know, it maybe becomes delusion. And I don't think that that's what desire God desires for us. I don't think that He desires for us to be people that worship Him because we're deluded about what's right in front of us. So um, I actually started writing an essay where I think I can really articulate these ideas more clearly, but it takes so much more time to write, even though that's the way that I think I can communicate best. I didn't want to keep waiting too long to get something together. This is kind of, I think this is like the fourth or fifth attempt I made to try to be coherent and explain this. And I don't know if I succeeded, but at least it's something that I can put out there to keep the conversation going. And as I said, if I'm wrong about everything that I'm saying about Judaism, it's Jacob's fault. So don't forget that. So thank you for listening. Now, if you feel like objecting to this by saying, you keep talking about God as transcendent. God called all these into existence, and therefore none of those are his nature. But wait a minute, is that right? I mean, isn't it the case that the Christian God is one God in three persons, is everywhere in space, can move from one place to another, can impact us physically, is God physical, among other things? Yes, he speaks of his power. He's the living God. He's the God who should be the object of our love, our strong feeling, but God has feelings for us. God is depicted in scripture as grieving over people who reject his love and incur on themselves punishment. Is God logical? God created the laws of logic, but he knows things, doesn't he? In fact, one text says God knows everything. Can God form things? He formed the whole universe. Is God linguistic? Can God speak? Scripture is full of instances in which God encountered humans and spoke. We, th we speak of the scripture as his word. The word comes from God, the word of love and salvation and forgiveness. That message is in words. It's in language. Is God social? What about the relation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Economic. God says to the people who have great wealth, you remember that, that, whole, that the whole world is mine. You're just allowed to use it for a while. There's no such thing in the Christian view as absolute ownership. God really owns it all. This is why in ancient Israel, he, he uh, imposed on them a law that said that if people got so hard up, they had to sell their farmland, that in 50 years, they got it back. Every 50th year, all land reverts to the original owner. So that it does not end up with the a small class of people owning everything and all the rest having to work for them. God prevents that as an injustice. We worship God in the beauty of holiness. And ethically, we exercise love to our fellow human beings because they're in the image of God. 
love your neighbor as yourself. And we put all our trust in God because God is the one reality that can never let us down. So what do you mean God transcends them all? God created them all, but they're all in some way true of him, aren't they? And the answer to that is yes. The Christian view is that God has created space, time, and all these kinds of properties and the laws that go along with them and has taken some of them into himself. Do you remember that that, uh, scheme I had on the board before? That for Christianity, the scheme is not just that there's God and there's creation. It's that God also enters creation and takes creation into himself. He takes into himself these created properties that constitute the nature in which he is pleased to manifest himself. That's quote John Calvin. The nature in which he's pleased, not the nature in which he cannot be otherwise and is stuck with, and this is what he is and didn't create it. No, it's the nature in which he is pleased to manifest himself. Because he has taken these properties into himself. I'm calling you that to your remembrance so that you understand my point here. While God has a nature that can be understood, he also transcends it. There is more to God than that. And the more we cannot know, we cannot conceptualize. That is deep and permanent mystery. <laughs>